You gain the favor of God by using your gifts and talents and ability to glorify God. Being used like a bank pen or a shopping cart sandy wipe, that is not getting you any closer to God. It's dark as a obsidian, and it light and beautiful and bright as the sun. The salt of the earth, fire burning and water dripping. How could they be using goddess of magic? She is timeless. The pillar of the desert need a plug. She is the wildest woman. And let me say it again for those who need to hear it. The black woman is God. Let me say it again. The black woman is God. of the wireless woman i am your girl debbie and the key and welcome to my spot room 303 if you are new welcome to the crew but returnees you know what we do if you like this video well then like this video let the comments reveal how you really feel and if you're feeling a vibe well hey go ahead on and subscribe but before you blink share this link now you know what time it is it is time for our traditional roll call i need all my empaths and codependents to the front of the class for read aloud all right so as you already know today's episode is called the narcissism of the empath but before we get into today's content i would like to encourage you to Follow me on all of my social media platforms. You can find the links for my social media under the About tab on my channel page. Also, I want to give you my email address again. If you'd like to email me in reference to any content you'd like to see or events and activities that are going on in the Charlotte area, my email address is admin at the wirelesswoman.com. All right, so before we get started, I have three disclaimers for this video. My first disclaimer is that I'm from North Carolina, y'all. So none of us here can say that we're narcissist, narcissism, all that. All that's going to sound like we got hot grits in our mouth. So you know what it is. Deal with it. My second disclaimer is that this Wireless Woman channel is not dedicated to narcissism awareness or the survivors of narcissism. Those time and energy vampires have sucked all the juice they're going to get out of me. But I do believe that some of the experiences and stories that I have along my journey to the wireless woman will be very impactful for other people. My third disclaimer is that while I know that all narcissists are not men, my content is geared towards women's issues and the female perspective. So the narcissist on this episode, they going to be men today. And if you don't like it, well, instead of hey yo, you can hey ya because you know what to do. Throw up three fingers and bless the prophet Andre 3000 for that one. All right, so we have to first establish a working knowledge of what narcissism is within the context of this content. Narcissism occurs within a spectrum, just like anxiety or autism, and it's actually a very healthy and natural response to the disappointments and setbacks of life. Without narcissism, a person wouldn't have the self-efficacy, self-confidence, self-esteem that's needed to bounce back from rejections or breakups or job loss. Narcissism is the healthy, 
thrive mechanism that allows people to come back better, to show up for themselves, advocate for themselves. As much as people love to identify themselves in a myriad of different ways, the terms narcissist and narcissism still have a very negative connotation, despite the fact that a lot of our favorite people are very highly narcissistic individuals. Our most beloved celebrities and entertainers, just about anybody that you find at the top of business, industry, and medicine, all of these people are capable of wielding very high levels of narcissistic energy. It's the energy, the essence that makes them successful, attractive, and competitive. It's also the same energy that makes them combative inflexible and uncooperative. Now, as much as we love and live to point out all of the fatal flaws of the narcissist, the empath is coming with equally detrimental deficiencies of their own. So the Oxford definition of empathy, which we will also use as the working definition for the context of this content, reads as follows. Empathy is the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within their frame of reference. That is the capacity to place oneself in another's position. In layman's terms, an empath has the ability to lose themselves. Shout out to Eminem. Now in times and days past, being able to walk a mile in another person's shoes might have been looked at as a virtue. But in today's generation, that don't get you nothing but ran off on the plug twice. As awareness and knowledge about narcissism and MPD grows, people are becoming more and more unwilling to recognize and identify toxic behaviors. And I think that's because the term narcissist comes with clinical implications. So people are hesitant to use it. The term narcissist is so overworked at this point that it really means nothing. And that's big trouble in Little China. Because that level of disassociation fosters an environment of cognitive dissonance that allows toxic people to thrive and hide in plain sight. I have coined the term entitlist instead of narcissist. I'm hoping that by zeroing in on the entitlement, people will be able to isolate the behaviors without feeling like they have to categorize or classify the person. A lot of people like to think of empaths and narcissists as being on opposite ends of a spectrum, but I see it more like a cycle, like a wheel. They're like polar opposites that revolve around each other, but use the same force. It's kind of like the Jedi's in Star Wars. You've got both the light and dark sides of the force. There is this really great content creator here in my home state of North Carolina. His name is Lee Hammock. He is a self-aware diagnosed narcissist and you can find him on all social media platforms at Mental Healness. I really love his content, but he gets a lot of flack for trying to help empathic people to get their power back. But the truth of the matter is in order to live an emotionally healthy, balanced life, you do need both your empathic traits as well as a little bit of narcissism, hence the title of my episode, The Narcissism of the Empath. Now, because Lee is a diagnosed narcissist, people may not feel like he's qualified to speak on it, but I myself am a reformed former empath in recovery. So all my fellow empaths, y'all come on to the carpet. You about to get this work. There's a special type of narcissism that empaths have that makes them think that they're different or better than narcissists. The truth is empaths more than any other type of people actually have more in common with the narcissist than they do in contrast. 
So before some of y'all start thinking that I'm actually a covert narcissist trying to masquerade as an empath, let me give you an analogy that helps to describe how I see it. So instead of seeing empaths and entitlists like superheroes and supervillains, I like to call it a tale of two gamblers or the casino. Okay, so picture this scene. We're in a casino. When in walks this young guy, he's fresh off of some Ponzi pyramid scheme and he's got loads of cash. Now he wants to play all of the high stakes games. He wants to play craps, roulette, poker, blackjack. But at the opposite end of the casino, there's an older woman and she's just gotten her social security check. She wants to come in and play the slots. Now she's seen this machine pay out time and time again during the month. And she's convinced that she's gonna sit at this machine until it pays out for her today. Now the dynamic between an entitlist and an empath mirrors a relationship between these two different types of gamblers. Here you got this entitlist and he's looking at this old lady like she's a sucker for him to lick. And this older lady is looking at this entitlist like the person that will take the risks that she won't, but poses the opportunity for a much higher reward than what she's willing to go after on her own. I mean, doesn't that just sound like a sexy, toxic cocktail? This is like the rum and coke Moscow mule of relationships. Just like learning about the life cycle of plants or butterflies in school, we're going to learn about the life cycle of a trauma bond. The root system of any good trauma bond is built on commonality. Those common personality and character traits allow empaths and entitledists to be able to emotionally mirror each other. This provides the root system for the trauma bond. So from this commonality, they're able to adopt a shared value system or what I call the buy-in. From that point, they moved from shared value system to shared fantasy or future faking. From shared fantasy, you move into the abuse cycle. And that sounds real abrasive, but it's really just a calibration and conditioning process. And that is the basis for the trauma bond. start with step one, which is common traits. So there are eight common traits between entitlist and empaths. Number one is codependency. Both entitlists and empaths have very high levels of codependency. A codependent can be either narcissistic or empathic. The codependency has no bearings on that. They both have a need to be dependent on other people for emotional regulation. It's just the means by which they go about having their codependent needs met that makes a difference between whether that person is an empath or an entitlist. Trait number two, both empaths and entitlists lack self-awareness. All the entitlist can see is themselves and all the empath can see is the entitlist. I can attest to this firsthand because I can honestly say during my relationship with an entitlist, I really could not see myself. After I got out of the relationship and I look back on so many of the decisions that I made during that time, I... I was completely unaware of how I was moving and looking within those situations. And looking back on it, it was easy and clear to see that level of manipulation. But when you're in that moment, you really can't see yourself for yourself. You're no longer a separate entity. You're just an extension of that entitlement. Trait number three is idealization. Both the entitlist and the empath are highly fantastic people. The entitlist has an idealized version of themselves and the empath has an idealized version of the entitlist. I mean, it's, it's the perfect storm. 
both the entitlist and the empath have a very deep need for validation. As a matter of fact, that need for validation sets the stage for the abuse cycle. Generally for these two people, they've never met anyone else like the other one who's able to provide that level of validation. That level of validation is actually what they call narcissistic supply. And both the empath and the entitlement need it in order to establish the trauma bond. Trait number five is poor boundaries or no sense of self. As much as people talk about how entitlements are self-centered and self-seeking, they don't actually have a lot of self-confidence or a clear self-image. So that lack of boundaries exists on both the empathic and the entitlement side of this coin. The entitlement really has a hard time saying no, just like an empath does. Personality trait number six is inflexible black and white thinking. Most of the time, empathic and entitlement people think just alike. That black and white, right and wrong, good or bad, win or lose way of thinking is something that keeps both of those people rationalizing the relationship. Outside of this dynamic, I actually see this a lot with Christians or people who are very religious. Religious programming and indoctrination can create a lot of that same inflexible thinking. Either something is all good or all bad. And so it makes it hard for these types of people to learn from their mistakes because everything in the gray area gets thrown out. Personality trait number seven, it actually goes with number eight. Entitlements and empaths both have conditional ethics, but unconditional loyalty. So personality trait number six is conditional ethics. These people can be compromised. Both empaths and entitlements can be compromised. And empaths fall prey to this even more than entitlements do. Empaths will fall for a sob story in a minute and everything you said that you were going to do just goes right out the window. You can be compromised. Empaths are highly unethical people, whether we're willing to admit that or not. And personality trait number eight is unconditional loyalty. The entitlement requires it and an empath is more than willing to give it based on that high level of validation that they receive from the entitlement. They believe for very good reason, because it's true, that the entitlement is going to be just as loyal to them as the loyalty that they are requesting in return. So for an empath and an entitlement, this is a very reasonable expectation. A lot of times an empath will describe their relationship with an entitlement as feeling like a twin flame type of dynamic. Entitlement will try to make you believe that that is just emotional mirroring that they do, that that's just a manipulation. And in a lot of ways, they are mirroring back to you what they find to be some of your best character, some of your best character and personality traits to you. More often than not, you actually do have these traits in common with an entitlement. Now, the place where this dynamic gets manipulative is in the shared value system phase of the trauma bond. With shared value system, that's the place where the narcissist starts to put on because they got to get you to buy in. Now, anyone who's ever had a customer service job knows what a buy in is. It's the place where you're able to get that person on the same page as you. Show them that you have something that they need, that the value of that thing is worth what you have to pay or sacrifice to get it. So a buy-in between an entitlement and a so a buy-in between an entitlement and an empath is going to look like buying that house, getting married, having that child starting that business, whatever values and empath put forward in the beginning of that relationship as being the things that would solidify the bond between them and the entitlement, that's what the entitlement is going to give and sacrifice to the relationship in return for your undying fidelity. 
from shared value system, you move into shared fantasy, which is all that future faking. That's the place where the icing and the sprinkles start going on the cake. That's where you fall in love with potential, where the actions of the entitlement stop matching up with what they where the actions of the entitlement stop matching up with what they said they would do. This is the cognitive dissonance phase of the relationship where they're saying one thing, but doing another thing, but you're falling in love with the potential of that thing. And you both are sharing this fictional future that you come up with. This is the stuff that romance novels and romance movies and toxic love anthems are made of. All of your favorite toxic love anthems are written by narcissists. A perfect example of this dynamic is in a song by Prince. It's the beautiful ones. He says in the song, paint a perfect picture, bring to life a vision in one's mind. The beautiful ones always smash the picture, always, every time. That song talks about that idealization phase where you really, really have a picture, an image, and it's perfect. And that black and white thinking solidifies it. It keeps you operating within the framework of that particular picture. Everything has to be just like that. So once they've got you on that string, once you are a link in that chain, 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 chain of fools. That's when you go from shared fantasy into the abuse cycle. And I just call it an abuse cycle, but for most people that are in it, they won't see it that way. They're not going to describe the in and out, up and down roller coaster with the entitlement that way. It's really just a calibration process. Once the entitlement finds someone who has the shared need for validation that they have, they're going to fill you up with validation and then siphon it back off and then spoon feed it back out to you in little doses. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's like you eat something, throw it up, then that person eats it and then they throw it up. It's, it's real toxic. That's how the calibration conditioning or abuse cycle works. So I liken this part of the trauma bond to what I call the pedestal and gallows. So the entitlement walks you up the stairs to this big, beautiful pedestal. You know, they set you head and shoulders above other people and just make you feel like the sun rises and sets on you. So then at that point, they're going to slip this nice little necklace noose around your neck. And, and over time, bit by bit, they're going to kick a step and another step out from underneath this pedestal. Now, I know what you're thinking, but I don't care what you say. People love strangulation games. Like a lot of people think that's really, really sexy to be like asphyxiated. That's another word I can't say. I don't know if it's a North Carolina thing, but to be asphyxiated, asphyxiated, you know what I'm saying, to be choked. Some people like to be choked. By some people, I mean me. OK, I mean, those strangulation games are so exhilarating for people. I mean, especially if you with somebody that knows how to do it right. Like anyway, my point in what I'm saying is that feeling is euphoric for both the entitlement and the empath. Them standing there watching your feet dangle and twist and kick. You know, but then you're right there at the brink of death and here they come sweeping in to save you. I've heard other people describe it as like setting you on fire and putting you out or throwing you in water to drown and then coming in to save you like some Baywatch stuff. I know my analogy is like a lot sicker and more twisted than that, but I mean, it works for me. It, it made sense for me. I'm going to hit you with a little bit of story time to explain the gallows. Um, so when I was about 19, I met this guy and, you know, I didn't really think anything special of him at first, which is the case with most entitlements. They don't seem on the surface to be these overwhelmingly awesome people. Some of the grandiose ones are 
Some of the grandiose ones can be a lot more charismatic, but just your run of the mill and titleist, they're, they're generally very unassuming people. And years later, after I look back on it, I realized that that person was able to get so close to me because he validated me. Simple as that. I thought all those years that I was in love with him, but I was actually in love with myself and how he made me feel about myself and the potential that he saw in me. Him seeing potential in me made me see potential in him that wasn't there. But anyway, so, you know, he was a person that spoke a lot of life into me, taught me a lot of things. And in some ways, he was kind of like a father figure. Fast forward 14 years, me and this person had been married to different people, divorced, had children, all of these things. But throughout it all, we had always maintained what I thought to be a deeply nurturing, intimate friendship. So we're sitting out at dinner one day and I say to this person, you know, we have done it. We have tried it so many times in so many different ways with other people. Like, why don't we try this? This has always been good for us and safe for us. Why not me and you? And he looked me dead ass in my face. And he said, you know, I just have a lot of things that I want to accomplish. And I don't really worry about you because I know that even when I'm done with everything else that I have to do, you'll still be single. And I mean, it took the air out of my chest. It was it was something that I didn't even really think was that big of a deal. But then I mean, I always thought that he saw me as a highly desirable woman. I mean, why else would we have stayed in proximity with each other? So I asked him, I said, what makes you think that I'll still be single? And he said, you have really high standards. Your standards are too high. And at, and at first, that really didn't mean anything to me. It was it was hard hearing him say that because he had always been a person that propped me up to have high standards. So I thought it was odd, but it didn't really dawn on me until I took time to sit down and look back through all the years. Now, this is that lack of self-awareness piece that I was telling you about, of not being able to see yourself and how you're moving throughout that dynamic. Now, I have... Now, I have had my share of narcissistic men. I attract them like a great satellite antenna. But this relationship meant so much to me, I think, because the roots were so deep, because he had gotten to me as a teenager before I really learned a lot about relationships. But when I looked back over our whole entire relationship, I started to see all the places where he had invalidated me, put other women before me, triangulated me with other people that he was in relationships with, devalued me, discarded me at times. With this person, I was never a primary intimate partner. I was always a secondary source of supply for them, but I started to see how that person had strung me along throughout all of these different experiences that I had with them, telling me one thing, but then showing me something else. And it was like in that moment, the spell broke. 14 years of my life had gone by buying into a shared fantasy with somebody that was going to trick off on me for the rest of their life if I let them do it. You know, and I actually have to be grateful for that experience because that was one of the things that allowed me to walk away from my narcissistic marriage so quickly. That abuse cycle of being able to lift you up and drop you down, light your candle and then put it out is the thing that really creates the glue and the cement for the trauma bond. But that relationship also brought me to a realization. I realized that that guy never chose me to be his primary intimate partner because he knew that because he knew something about me that I didn't know about myself. He knew that for all of those high stakes casino games, I could walk away. He had watched me throughout those years disengage and discard toxic relationships. And he knew that I wasn't capable of that level of abuse. <laughs> 
Now, if you've managed to stay with me this far into the video, I need you to go ahead and drop a headphones emoji into the comments below. <whistles> to all of my fellow empaths, you have to resist ego. You got to let that shit go. You can't be wrapped up in that perfect picture. You have to you have to, just like the words of the Prince song, break that mirror, reject that shared fantasy, and wake up, sleeping beauty. Your Prince Charming is a predator. You don't have to hate the entitlers. Don't love them. Definitely don't love them. But you can learn from them. You need to get you a little bit more of that narcissism in past. Zhuzh it up a little bit. And you don't need a narcissist to get it. Your entitlement is just a human representation of your own inner child. All of that love and validation that you really need, just give it to yourself. Go on in that closet. Get your own traumatized inner child out and play with yourself. No pun intended. <laughs> Go ahead and play with your own inner child instead of someone else's Michael Jackson. I had to accept that I wasn't just an empath. I was a codependent. And you'll hear me say this a lot on this channel. I was a good old fashioned junkie. I was an addict. It was the addiction to the thrill of the game that kept me in it. You have to resist you have to resist so much ego to be able to walk away from the table. Love doesn't string you up. It doesn't want to keep you in chains. Love wants you to be free to be. And that is actually one of the resources that helped me a lot. I'm going to link Dr. Les Carter down in the description box so you can follow him. Struggle love is not love. I had to accept my own narcissism. You know, I was playing God in the situation. I thought that my love and my validation, me sacrificing myself was enough to save the entitlement. The talents and gifts that God gave you are to be used by him to bless other people. Not to not to gain not to gain the favor of people. You gain the favor of God by using your gifts and talents and ability to glorify God. Being used like a bank pen or a shopping cart sandy wipe, that is not getting you any closer to God. <whistles> Millennials, particularly this participation trophy generation and social media are spawning a new generation of psychologically disturbed, emotionally immature entitlements. And empaths, we're going to have to evolve in order to survive or else we're going to become extinct, just like the Neanderthals who had the bigger brains, the larger, stronger statures, and every genetically predisposed advantage that should have made them beat out the Homo sapiens for survival. But the one thing that they lacked was the ability to change and adapt to their environment. Empaths, we got to out-finesse these entitlements. We've got to use our empathy and passive resistance, resilience, and creativity to override the factory presets of these entitlements. You have to be able to go wireless. You have to be able to get off the grid. When I unplugged from social media, I was able to defeat my shadow man outside of the matrix. I could do all of that self. I could do all of that self-doubt work without having to compare myself against other people and watch everyone else's highlight reels. I trained outside of the matrix to be unbothered. You know, that's my motto, unplugged, unbothered, and unleashed. And that is my superpower. Being unbothered, the ability to disengage is a fucking superpower in this day and age. You have to be able to say, okay, and take all of that palm sweating, heart racing, anxious reactivity and go do some other peaceful, productive, gainful activity. You have to stop being pulled along and go ahead and turn around and push these entitlements from the emotional ledge and move 
on. For the first time in a long time, I finally have my anxiety all the way under control, which now I really think it was more pressure to perform or what I like to call black superwoman syndrome that was causing me to have so many anxiety issues in the first place. Now I'm unleashed. Now I am an empath with narcissistic traits. I'm like a narcissist empath hybrid or in layman's terms, a normal ass person. Did you ever think that it would just be a normal, emotionally healthy person that could defeat the machines? But that's the thing that entitlists love to hate about you. It's your ability to escape the matrix, to transcend it. You have that much power. It's already been within you. You've been trying to give it away to the entitlist in your life. Jalisa is Sheila. Sheila is Jalisa. No fool me. No fool me. You don't fool them. It's your signal, your essence. It's your vibration that brings all those smiths and sentinels to you. Like Lee Hammock would tell you, take your power back and stand in it. Own it. An entitlist will take your empathy and weaponize it against you. Empathy is a two-edged sword. You can either wield it or you'll be wounded by it. Just like what I said in the Sigma female video about being able to harness both masculine and feminine energy, you have to think of it that way. Your empathy is like a two-edged sword. That's what your narcissism is for. Use it like a shield to protect yourself. It's your boundaries, your standards, your self-efficacy. It's standing up for yourself and knowing that no one has the power. You, you can't make anyone in your life a God. No one has the power to validate you or devalue you. All of those things start from within yourself. These are all of the things, these are all of the things that you brought to the table with you that made that entitlist love you in the first place. Now let that be the thing that makes you love yourself. If I learned anything from the entitlist in my life is that you have to put your air mask on first. You can't help anyone else. And a true a truly healthy empath knows that they have to fill their own bucket up before they can offer someone else a cup. All right. Thank you for your time. Thanks for stopping in for this episode of The Wireless Woman. I do appreciate all of your comments and all of your support. If there's anything you don't feel comfortable sharing in the comments that you'd like to reach me directly, go ahead and use that email admin at the wirelesswoman.com i would love to hear your stories i will answer back and i will see you in the next one class is now dismissed